And really the, the only sort of solutions, even back then that were sort of long lasting, are those solutions, those reform attempts that try to break away from the central government. You are listening to And If Love Remains, a unique show spotlighting people, ideas, science, culture, and art. Your host, Mike Lovett. Mike Lovett. Hi, and welcome to And If Love Remains. I'm your host, Mike Levitt, and I am very happy to have on the line today, Dr. Patrick Newman. Uh, Dr. Newman is a fellow at the Mises Institute. Uh, he is also assistant professor of economics at Florida Southern College and a fellow of its Center for Free Enterprise. He completed his PhD in economics at George Mason University. His primary research interests include Austrian economics, monetary theory, and late 19th and early 20th century American economic history. He is editor of Murray Rothbard's The Progressive Era, along with his pr brilliant transcription and editing of Rothbard's lost fifth volume of Conceived in Liberty, The New Republic, 1784 through 1789. And he is the author of a new book, Cronyism, Liberty versus Power in Early America, 1607 to 1849, which we're gonna spend a lot of time talking about. Very exciting book. Thank you, Patrick, for being on the show. Thanks for having me on. It's uh, it's a pleasure to be here, and I'm happy to talk about my uh, my book. Absolutely, absolutely. Um, before we get into that, I want to talk to you a, a little bit about the Mises Institute. I've I've told anybody who'll listen to me that I think the two institutions in America that need more money and more influence is the Mises Institute and the Tenth Amendment Center. Um, I think though, you know, you guys are really the powerhouse. Uh, um, yeah. Uh, you know, think house for uh, for for liberty, and 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 I'm just really thrilled to to see the the work that's coming out. How did you get involved with Mises, and 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 tell my listeners what what the Mises Institute is? Yeah, so the Mises Institute is an organization. It's based in Auburn, Alabama, and it's <clears throat> really big on promoting Austrian economics and libertarianism. So it's very big on promoting the ideas of thinkers such as. Ludwig von Mises, Murray Rothbard, Henry Hazlitt, Ron Paul, uh, and so on. And it's really just designed not necessarily to influence politicians and public policy in D.C., but really just to try and get ideas out there. So just to teach your average person uh, Austrian economics and natural rights-based libertarianism. Uh, it's a great organization. I'm, I'm very happy and very proud to be affiliated with it. I myself had gotten interested in economics when I was a senior in high school during the financial crisis, and I had read a Ron Paul book, and he had directed me to this website, Mises.org, and I had immediately become hooked. I became a summer fellow there in 2012 and 2013 when I was an undergraduate, so I was there in the summer. I was able to read books, work with various faculty who were there in the summer as well, and were and you know just write my own research. And then after I got my PhD, I've basically been associated with them on a more um, regular standardized basis, editing books for them. They recently published my, uh, my, my, my own first book, and it's just really a great organization. I'm happy to be a part of it. And it's, uh, it's, I do agree with you. It's one of those organizations that deserves much more influence and money. Yeah, I, I, it's it's fantastic, and and one of the great things. I mean, there's lots of great things about it, but I do appreciate how much material they they put out that um, really is accessible. Um, I'm I'm just a crazy musician. I mean, the, really, the, my my uh, economics history first came from a you know a, a, a rap tune about Hayek and and <laughs> Keynes, <laughs> you know, about ten years ago, um, and and from there, you know, I, I've I've just kind of I've been constantly, you know, looking at the Mises Institute as as a great resource for for wonderful talks, um, contrarian views on that you're not going to hear from the mainstream, and and really like how we maybe should th uh, think through some of these ideas of liberty and power and tyranny and 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 uh, you know what what the elites are doing to us. 
Yeah, absolutely. I, I remember that Kane's Hayek video. I had watched it and I was like, oh, this is great. Uh, you know, fear of the boom and the bust and all, all right. that. You can still find it on YouTube. And, and yeah, I, I, once I, once I started to get interested in Austrian economics and reading Mises.org, I had, um, quickly became a, you know, I quickly was devouring all of their information on economic history and just history in general. Uh, and, and that just was a huge influence for me. And, uh, yeah, I'm, I'm glad I'm not the only one. It's always great to talk to other people who got into this stuff r right around the same time as yeah. I did. And, uh, and yeah, when I, when I, when I was younger, I always wanted to be a mad scientist and now I'm an economist. I have a PhD, and so I guess in the same sense, I'm I'm still a mad scientist. So it's right. <laughs> it's full full circle. <laughs> now, what what about Murray Rothbard? Is such a I mean, you've you've made yourself into a, a, one of the foremost experts on Murray Rothbard. Uh, I mean, you're you're a relatively young guy, but did you get a chance to meet him? And and uh, what? Tell me about your your how did he influence your thinking? Yeah, so I never met Murray Rothbard. He unfortunately died unexpectedly and relatively early. Um, you know, he was about 67, in, uh, so he died in early 1995. So he was before my time. I never met him. I've sometimes referred to him as the mentor I've never met because I've been very influenced by his, his books, his articles, his audio recordings. I have the privilege of working in the Rothbard archives at the Mises Institute. So this houses all of his letters and his personal correspondence and rough drafts wow. and all sorts of other stuff. And it's an absolute pleasure to be in there. I, I, I feel as though I'm a kid in a candy store when, I, uh, when, I'm, when I'm in there, just simply because you, you, you get access to various documents that no one has seen. And, and, and uh, this is just new information that you can help publish and et cetera. I had started to work in the Rothbard archives when I was a fellow in about 2013, and I had seen that there were several manuscripts that he had written that were not published, notably the Progressive Era, as well as Conceived in Liberty Volume 5, this, um, this handwritten volume on um, the, the 1780s, that uh, tumultuous period in American history. And I basically, uh, I, 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 I I edited them. I, I, I learned how to read Murray Rothbard's handwriting. I was going to say, is it true that his handwriting is just amazingly atrocious? Oh, absolutely. It, it truly looks like something that the founding fathers would have written. It's this <laughs> overflowing cursive, and he sometimes he would write his ands as pluses. He would abbreviate things. I had to basically learn a whole new language, Rothbardanese. <laughs> and it was a great pleasure reading this because apparently his wife couldn't even read his handwriting. I had to learn how to read his handwriting. Uh, I provided, you know, I... I, I published this, this document that was more or less lost to time uh, simply because of, uh, of, of the issue that, that the handwriting was this, was this huge burden. And I had started to listen to, after reading Ron Paul, I had um, read Murray Rothbard's What Is Government Done to Our Money? That was the second book I've ever read economics related. Uh, shortly thereafter, I started to listen to various recordings of Rothbard and his, his humor, his perspective, his wit, all of that just greatly influenced me. So I, that's why I try to kind of carry on the Rothbardian perspective, uh, such as in my, uh, my new book, Cronyism. Yeah, and 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 that really is a, an extension of that uh, the theory. And, and so, I guess before we get directly into the book, let's talk a little bit about his um, liberty versus power theory. And because that's the, one of the things I love about history is because it is so complex and um, you know so widespread that, that you can have a lot of uh, competing theories that that are that may that may be true. Um, but may not explain where we are today perfectly. And, and so I, I think about like the 1619 Project that you say, yes, you can find cases for, um, you know, obviously slavery existed, you know, th these, these things happened. Um, but what does that explain today? And so I think it's really important for a theory to kind of hold water is to say, how does this theory um, explain what we're experiencing today. And, and, and so talk about Rothbard's liberty versus power theory and how that uh, works into your book. Yeah. So the, the liberty versus power theory is one of Rothbard's um, theories that he used when writing Conceived in Liberty. He himself had really gotten this from 
uh, Lord Acton, this noted uh, British historian, uh, as well as really the um, American colonists in the 1700s. They themselves had argued for this. And many prominent historians in the 1950s and 60s and early 70s, such as Bernard Bailyn and Gordon Wood, uh, had also spoken about this. And this was a big theme in Rothbard's five-volume series on American history called Conceived in Liberty. So the liberty versus power theory basically argues that history is a clash, a uh, struggle between the various groups that are libertarian or pro-small government, they're anti-cronyism, so they're anti-special interest legislation, they want to downsize government, as well as the forces of power. Okay, these are the groups that want to increase the size of government. They support cronyism, special privileges, and, and so on. So history is really a struggle between these two groups. And when the forces of liberty win, when the forces of the market, free market win, then uh, people flourish. You have an increase in the standards of living. When the forces of power win, then you see sort of a retrogression in living standards and, uh, and so on. So this is the the, the first uh, basically uh, te- component of this liberty versus uh, excuse me of the liberty versus power theory, and it held in America because you actually had at the time you had a sizable portion, really a majority in many cases of Americans who work libertarian. They could be considered small government. They were uh, pro free market or anti government in, intervention in, in many forms and so on. So that's the first component. The second component is that when the forces of liberty win and they do have control of the government, they do try to reform the government, they only really get so much stuff done because power corrupts. So controlling the government incentivizes the people using the government to try and sponsor their own forms of cronyism and special privileges and so on. So they, the, the, the libertarian coalitions, such as the Jeffersonian Republicans or the Jacksonian Democrats, they get into power, they pass some reforms, but then they start to moderate. They look ahead to the next election. They say, we need to expand our coalition. We need to focus on these sorts of policies, um, you know, that might benefit special interests and so on. And then the third component is that reforming the government is difficult precisely because power corrupts. So it's kind of cronyism and power. They have this built-in mechanism that prevents its own decline. So the, this is the this liberty versus power theory. I was greatly influenced by, and I think it's a great explanation of the history of cronyism, the history of special interest policies uh, in early America, pre- precisely because you did have major political parties that were actually genuinely interested in change. They were fighting against those parties that were trying to increase cronyism, and uh, they did win elections and they did pass policies, uh, very significant Uh, reform policies. And this is something that's very different than the modern era when you really just kind of have two power, uh, two parties. They're both interested in power. Um, They disagree with each other only for sort of partisan reasons. They're both kind of crony in varying degrees. Uh, But it wasn't always the case. America, early American history was much different. Well, and and that's a, I think, um, just to go back a little bit, I think one of the problems and this isn't really a pushback but it, it's a question is is um, part of the problem is those who recognize power as corrupting need to be the ones that are in power in order to keep from power from corrupting in other words it comes it becomes almost a circular problem of of the people that 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 want cronyism the people that that want to to take over and be meddlesome in our lives um, end up the, being the ones that that obtain the power to do so. And so then it takes a strong force to pull those people out. And the second that you go, okay, we've done it, then they come back because there's always going to be a group of people trying to, 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 you know, obtain that power over our lives. Yeah, absolutely. And this is, this is sort of the paradox in that it's, it's really hard to reform the government precisely because you're always going to see this pressure to increase cronyism uh, within a government structure or within, you know, the nation's capital, such as Washington, D.C. And people always ask me, they say, okay, well, then how do exactly do we do we stop this? And, you know, how do we reform Washington, D.C., so, so to speak? And my answer is, is always the same. And it's that, look, if in early American history, when we had a lot more people who were against cronyism, if they couldn't reform Washington, D.C., 
That means we can't reform Washington, D.C. And really, the, the only sort of solutions, even back then, that were sort of long-lasting are those solutions, those reform attempts that try to break away from the central government, right? So you're not really going to be, you're never really going to be able to reform Washington, D.C., sort of clear out the cronies, clear out the special interests. All you can do is just try to take power away from them by simply shifting power to the state and local level, supporting movements like nullification and secession, which we've increasingly seen not only in America, but around the world, you know, with Catalonia, Kurdistan, Brexit, et cetera. And while you're still going to obviously have cronyism at the state and local level, it will be less than at the federal level, precisely because a lot of cronyism at the state and local level is always arguing over how to get more money from the federal government. So this is this is the this is the struggle. It, it, it's 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 the unfortunate reality, but I, I think it is the reality is that you can't reform Washington D.C. You're not going to be able to um, just have you know, a, a libertarian. Um, you know, presidential candidate is going to win, and then you know, in just one foul swoop, it's all going to go away. Um, it, it's really about trying to disassociate yourself from that central government agency. Right on, that's great. Well, um, going going to your books, um, this is uh, uh, actually from chapter. It's really fascinating to me how uh, you know you say you first of all cronyism. Everybody hates cronyism. Like you hear the word and, and you get a bad taste in your mouth. And yet it is like the constant thing, as you point out from the beginning, um, that that history kind of, there, there's this undertide, undertow of, of cronyism throughout it. And, uh, and I just love little quotes like this from your book. This is uh, from p- chapter one. Uh, in, in 1606, James chartered the North Virginia Company and the South Virginia Company, named after the uh, the Virgin Queen. Each grants to uh, unappropriated lands. James uh, James gifted the new the North Virginia Company, soon called the Plymouth Company, the area from modern New York to Maine. While he granted the South Virginia Company, soon called the Virginia Company, a tract from modern North Carolina to Virginia. In 1609, James egregiously extended ownership of the latter from sea to sea to to the other end of the continent. In addition, he assigned the lands between companies uh, to the the first claimant. But when the Dutch later settled the land, England confiscated it through war. And to me, that's just such a, uh, in, in one paragraph, it kind of puts together, here's a guy who is, you know, by fiat, just saying, we you have this and you have this. And if anybody gets in your way, we're just going to take it from them. And, uh, Uh, yeah, it's, it's, that's a great, uh, that's a, that's a great analysis because really cronyism was, 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 uh, from the beginning. It it was, it was with us from the beginning. In fact, with the settlements such as King James, just simply gifting an enormous amount of land to two companies, uh, in Virginia, uh, even throughout its colonial era, you know, the, the colonial era, it, it, it still did claim ownership of not only the Midwest, but um, at, at various points to the Pacific Ocean. And this is just it's just a ridic- ridiculous sort of uh, privilege that, you know, one makes no sense from an economic or really legal basis, but it's just backed by a government force. And this is something that repeatedly happened not only in the past, but also in the present. And it's it's really important to kind of expose it for what it is. It's not some sort of grandiose thing designed to benefit the public and all of that. It's really just uh, you're when you're in power, you got to spread the loot. So you know you give it to your favorite supporters. That happens in the past and it happens in the present all the time. Well, and, and we see we see that. I mean, we could talk about the the. Uh, the loot being spread by the the <laughs> by the pandemic that we've been experiencing the last few years, but but there's actually a, a more. I, I just heard about this case yesterday where um, uh, a group of of employees at a hospital in Wisconsin wanted to move to another hospital. They got a better offer. They went to the first hospital and said, "Oh, can you match it?" The first hospital said no, so they all quit to go to the second hospital. And what did what did the first hospital do? They went right to a judge and got a TRO to keep them from moving to the other hospital. <laughs> you know, so a government judge is telling a, in an at-will state employees that they can't move from one hospital to another for, you know, to make more money. Wow! Yeah, that that that's that's a great illustration uh, of of cronyism in action, and 
And it, it just shows you how much businesses and other groups will use the government in order to accomplish their aims. And really, the name of the game is is to obtain some sort of monopoly or restricted uh, competition. And most businesses on the free market, you can't obtain a monopoly. It's very hard to due to external and internal pressure of new competition and, and internal cheating. Uh, but with the government, you can create all these little monopolies preventing uh, consumers from getting other products or workers from uh, moving around. And a lot of people blame it on capitalism, but it's really just due to cronyism. Yeah. Yeah. In, in fact, um, uh, you know, a lot of people, I think, make the mistake of, of calling cronyism crony capitalism as if, you know, there was a um, that that was a part of the you know un, un, there's capitalism and then underneath capitalism there's crony capitalism like that's a part of it. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I was originally so I was asked to write a history of crony capitalism. Someone affiliated with the Mises Institute approached me for this, and after much deliberation, I decided not to use the word capitalism and instead to use the word cronyism for precisely the reasons you you mentioned that. A lot of times when it, it, it's some it's, it's it's called when it's called crony capitalism, it's a subtle indictment of capitalism, which you can just basically define as the free market and voluntary exchange. And I think capitalism is actually the antithesis of cronyism. So it's not that it, it's sort of a, a system of capitalism that is is screwing people. It's the capitalist elements of that system that's actually uh, reducing the cronyism. So cronyism is its own separate system, and it's not directly linked with capitalism per se. Uh, the other thing that the other reason why I, I wanted to just use the word cronyism is there's uh, there's just an intense amount of political cronyism regarding elections or uh, politicians and bureaucrats staying in power and trying to screw their own competitors. That's somewhat conceptually distinct from the market economy. So that's why I, I prefer to use the word cronyism. It's just its own system and capitalism is separate from it. You know, I, I, and I appreciate that because I think that that's a fact. I, it's, it's a completely separate. I was, I remember, uh, um, years ago, I think this is before the crisis. Um, I was listening to, uh, Glenn Beck on the, on the radio and he was talking to, um, he was talking about a billionaire as he was flying over Texas and, and the billionaire was explaining to him all the tracts of land that he had bought and how everything was going to be laid out. And, 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 uh, you know, and he said, look, and the highway is going to come right through here. And, you know, so all of this land right here is going to be worth millions and it's going to go up in value. It's an incredible opportunity. And, and Glenn Beck almost as a passing statement said, and I realized this is how the billionaires get to be billionaires because they know. And, and I had a similar thought, but my other thought was, well, yeah, and it's a lot easier to, to pay off a politician to have the road go through there than to try to build up the road yourself. You know, that's, that's a, you know, from an economics perspective for the guy, for the, you, let's use cronyism as long as it works. Yeah, absolutely. And, and, and this is something that a lot of people don't understand. And I try and emphasize in my own book, it's true, as, as you mentioned now, as well as in early American history, a lot of people make their money through the government by engaging in various sorts of uh, land speculation or speculation in financial security. So they're able to lobby the government to build a road through a district, which is going to enormously increase property values or to get some sort of land grant or other subsidies. In my own book, I talk about one of the reasons why, uh, really the, and the main reason, there's it's sort of a full story. I, I find it so fascinating, but the main reason why our nation's capital, Washington, D.C., is located where it is, is because Washington wanted uh, his capital, or wanted the capital, he was given the power to choose where the capital would be um, in along the Potomac River or along this narrowly defined boundary. And he actually lobbied the government to allow him to move the capital out of that area closer to his land, right? This property <laughs> in Alexandria, which immensely increased the value of his property. Um, and yeah, I mean, that, that was around, uh, uh, at the nation's beginning. And of course it's, it's only gotten worse since then. I mean, the department of the interior is full of cronyism regarding various sorts of land speculation deals and, 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 and so on. And it's just something that is a lot of people don't know about. And that's because the, the, the powers that be don't want people to know about it. Yeah. And that, that is a great story that, by the way, I think another 
subtitle of your book could have been something like, you know, how to shatter graven images, because there's so many people that put our founding fathers on pedestals. And and I think they did, as you mentioned before, there's some great work done and some, you know, some real great libertarian ideas. But, but man, not only is your book very readable, but we surely shatter some graven images in it. And, and we see a lot of the the cronyism that occurred that that are that is somehow lost in our in our government schools today. Mm-hmm. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, the I, I try to leave um, I, I try to leave no sacred cows unslaughtered and really sort yeah. of show um, a lot of our heroes, or at least the heroes maybe you and I were taught uh, that were heroes in, and when, when we were going through school, they, they actually aren't heroes; they're crooks. Um, then even the heroes that people nowadays praise. So someone like Hamilton, I think was the worst, um, you know, a, a, a real big crony. I do have praise for individuals. Ironically, those are the individuals that are demonized the most. Now guys like Thomas Jefferson and Andrew Jackson, because I did think they, they weren't perfect, but they did try to fight cronyism. And that's something that should be respected. That should be praised. And it also should be taught to other people. But we have this idea that the and it happened. It's a, it, we have this conception. It's it, we think about it. It's true not only in the past but also in the present. That politicians are actually there to serve the public good, and that more importantly, it's like these guys have no lives. They they didn't do anything before they came into office, and then they don't do anything after, right? And they just serve this job, and they're just this public interested servant. We don't look at okay, what were their financial dealings? What were their business? connections and and all sorts of other stuff like that. Because once we do that and we see, okay, uh, so-and-so engaged in a lot of land speculation or so-and-so um, had married the daughter of a prominent businessman, blah, 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 blah. It, 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 it makes the picture a lot clearer because then we realize that, okay, uh, maybe these people aren't actually interested in the promoting the public welfare. Maybe they're just interested in promoting their own uh, financial well-being. Yeah. Well, and there's a there's one specific villain I want you to touch on because it's somebody that that I had never heard of, and I don't think most people have heard of, and that uh, Robert Morris is that his his name? Yep, Robert uh, Morris. The- Robert Morris, and and he is he he is an amazing cat. I'll tell you. <laughs> mm-hmm, mm-hmm, yeah. T- tell us a little bit about Robert Morris and his influence um, with the the uh, you know with the the founding. Yeah, absolutely. So Robert Morris was a very wealthy Philadelphia merchant. So at the time of the Revolutionary War, Philadelphia was really the financial capital of the United States. New York City had not really gotten there yet. It really took until the um, mid-1800s, 1830s, 1840s, so to speak. He was a wealthy Philadelphia merchant. And he had enormous control uh, over the the, the financing uh, of, of the of the Revolutionary War. So once it was decided not to engage upon some sort of guerrilla warfare, but actually some sort of conventional military warfare, well, that means you have to have the Continental Congress uh, uh, hire various firms to, to to produce the relevant uh, you know goods, you know the military products. Uh, you know, procure the, the, all the supplies. There's a lot of war contracts involved. And Robert Morris was in charge of the committees that w- were in charge of uh, that, you know, just dispersing these contracts. And of course, he sent many of, of the, the, the government's orders to his own firm, Willing and Morris. He was very interested in debt speculation, so buying up debt at very depreciated rates and then lobbying gov- the, the, the respective uh, the federal and state governments to redeem him at par, making him a lot of money. He had pushed for our nation's first central bank, really the uh, proto central bank. It was the Bank of North America. He was uh, kind of the intellectual father of Alexander Hamilton. And he had actually recommended Hamilton for the secretary of the treasury job. A lot of Hamilton's policies in the 1790s uh, benefited Robert Morris and his various associates. So Robert Morris was an extremely wealthy individual. He was extremely uh, prominent um, in our nation's sort of fiscal and monetary affairs. And it should come as no surprise that he was also a senator from Pennsylvania, right? Which again (laughs) shows you the, 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 the government business partnership. And so Robert yeah. Morris is a fascinating individual. Not enough people know about him, but he was in many ways America's first crony. Yeah, for sure. And and um, 
you know, it is, it is fascinating to, to see. Um, oh, I, in fact, I have a question and then I want to go back, but, but and, what do you suspect? And, and, and what do you think would have happened? Let me ask you this way. Um, Cause one of the, what, one of the options that the colonial uh, colonials had were to just default on the debt. And, and I was taught that one of the great parts of the constitution was that it kept our, you know, the credit standing in the world for America and it made us a, a immediately a, a big player on the, on the world stage. Um, but, but there was, there is an argument you talk about in your book of just defaulting on the debts. What would have happened? Do you suspect would have happened if maybe the articles of confederation were kept in place? We defaulted on the debts. What happens next? So that would have tremendously. So one, a lot of people don't necessarily know this is that. So one, they when they do understand the debt, they they know that okay, we paid during the war, we financed the war by basically printing money, and also giving out security so that they were we would pay in the future. We, we didn't have the power to tax the Articles of Confederation. And it was like, okay, we try and get that taxing power in the future. So we would pay soldiers and merchants with debt securities, et cetera. So when a lot of people think, uh, they hear the suggestion that, oh, if we default on the debt, this would this is this would hurt the people who own the securities these poor farmers these poor soldiers merchants these people who had risked life and limb so our countries could be could be independent etc what they don't realize is that really by the end of the war and in the mid 1780s and increasingly throughout the decade the the debt was held by wealthy northern speculators who had basically bought it from farmers sold soldiers etc at depreciated rates. So most of that debt was held by these speculators. There were some foreigners, such as the French uh, and some Dutch, who also held the debt. Uh, but again, it was also mainly speculators. In fact, some of them were linked with the American speculators. So if we had defaulted on the debt, this means we would have uh, cut down our payments. Um, we would have downsized the interest payments, et cetera, restructured the obligations. If we repudiated, we would have totally declared the, 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 the debt uh, void. We're not going to pay it, et cetera. I actually think default and repudiation, as some other economists, such as Jeffrey Rogers Hummels, uh, was actually the right solution to take during this time period. Because what that would have done is that would have tremendously weakened the government's credit, and it would have made them harder for them to borrow uh, in later years. So whenever people talk about, oh, we have so much debt, the United States, we're groaning under this, this burden of debt. Well, it's because we've had all this strong credit that has allowed the United States government to borrow uh, tremendously from its own citizens as well as from abroad. So it would have weakened our government's ability to borrow, which made it would have made it harder for them to, to, to engage in various interventions. It also would have reduced the tax burden. Uh, when we did assume the debt under Hamilton, uh, the debt was paid for with taxes on um, uh, d domestic goods, so like a whiskey tax and tariffs. Both of these fell mainly on poor uh, farmers, particularly those poor Western farmers. They have to pay more for goods uh, to buy them from abroad, et cetera. When I'm speaking of Western farmer, I'm speaking of like the Appalachian Mountains. That was the extent of the country at this time period. And the debt instead uh, was held by wealthy, uh, wealthy individuals. So it really was a giant redistribution racket. I do think us not, uh, if we, we did not assume the debt. Instead, we defaulted and we didn't have a taxing power to pay off the debt. The country would have broken up into separate confederacies, uh, and this would have been all for the better. So by us assuming the debt, we did save our country's credit rating, but we tremendously increased the ability for future cronyism um, in the years ahead. And, and in the end, it, it did exactly the opposite of what we're taught, which is, again, it, it hurt the small farmers. It, you know, the, the, I mean, the Whiskey Rebellion itself um, is, is kind of proof of that. Um, you know, these taxes that, that, were, that were placed upon these, um, these poor people. And so it, it is, it, it, as it seems to always be, it's, it's the poor and, quote, middle class that are, that are paying for the elite and cronies that, um, that have somehow structured a, a deal um, where they're too big to fail. Oh, absolutely. And, and this is 
time and time again, this happened in American history. And of course, when you look at the major beneficiaries of uh, assuming the debt, it was, as I mentioned, the wealthy Northern speculators. And one of those was Robert Morris and his whole group. Mm -hmm. So this is, <laughs> this is the whole circle of uh, the, the whole cycle, I guess, of, of, of cronyism, where it's that elites push for a measure they say will benefit the public, but in reality, it only benefits special interests. And by the time the average person figures this out, well, the, 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 the news cycle, so to speak, has moved on to another thing. People have, don't care about it anymore. And that's how you basically get the system uh, perpetuating. It it's, it's, it's basically runs off of ignorance. It runs off of ignorance of the average person. And that's why it's very important to communicate these ideas to one, explain uh, the actual true American history and show how, you know, it's, it, it show its relevance for the, for the present because there's, yeah. you know, we're, we're not talking about debt assumption now in 2022. We're talking about, you know, cronyism related to the Federal Reserve or, or COVID regarding vaccine, vaccine mandates right. and, um, you know, infrastructure bills, et cetera. Right. Yep. And absolutely. Or, or bailing out banks, you know, when they fail. Yeah. Um, yep. yep. All, all these sorts of things that 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 that, you know, those seeds were planted way back um, in, in the early. And, and you and you, I love that that you point this stuff out. Um, I do want to back up because and you talked about this earlier, how um, America as a whole was a, a libertarian nation. I think there's a um, and you mentioned this as a as a misquote. Um, that only a third of the Americans, you know, were in favor of of seceding from England, and uh, and the, the truth is uh, that was a misquote because it was about a different revolution. <laughs> but it was also a misquote from a standpoint that that it was an uprising, a ground up uprising, um, as opposed to a top down um, wanting to, um, you know, a lot a lot of the elites, a lot of the northern elites, as you mentioned, you know, wanted either. Uh, the same as, or, or if anything, they wanted just, you know, they wanted more representation in parliament, but they, they weren't in interested in, in, in cutting ties with the crown. Absolutely. Yeah. And so you had a tremendous, as a common mis misconception that, um, your average American was, was not in favor of independence. Uh, it was only about a third that was, comes from a John Adams letter where he's actually talking about the French revolution, not the American revolution. The American revolution did have a lot of, um, uh, a, a ground level support. This was unlike the ratification of the U S constitution, which was really kind of, um, put on the the American people by a, a small elite in that, yeah, you did have your average American. They, they were interested in sort of proto-libertarianism. They were interested in breaking away from Great Britain. This is... This is something that I, I, I mentioned throughout my book in various stages is that elites might come up with an idea, but they do disseminate it to the average person. Now, if someone like John Locke is writing a complicated book, two treatises of government on natural rights and social contract theory, et cetera, well, your average American then as now is not really going to read these massive books. Um, they are going to be influenced by John Locke, by uh, – pamphlets, which were very big back in the day, notably Cato's letters. So that's how they learn about these things. And it's similar now, you you know, you might have a an academic such as myself, he writes a book uh, on cronyism. And, you know, some people read the book, etc. But how you really maximize that influence is, well, you, you, you have a podcast, uh, you know, series talking about the book is what I have with the Mises Institute, Liberty versus Power podcast, and going on other podcasts, such as your own uh, podcast to talk about this. You know, that's how the ideas actually get filtered down to the average person. Yeah, absolutely. And, and, and it does need to be, you know, uh, there's a lot of, uh, um, re or deep programming that needs to be done. So I hope, hopefully we can be a small part of that. Um, there's a, you have a, a great quote here, um, because I think this kind of number one points to what we're talking about, about, about the American revolution being a, a groundswell of Liberty, as well as, um, it speaks to, um, uh, well, the, the, the things that the cronies had to fight against there, there's a, um, let me just this, I think this is from chapter two. I'm not sure, but it says the most, uh, prominent example of the new state, po uh, policy. Oh, sorry. 
Yeah. <laughs> well, the most All common right. example example of the new of the new state uh, polities was Pennsylvania, which Murray Rothbard describes as a beacon of inspiration to libertarianism and a triumph of the radicals in the fall of 1776 against the resistance of the entrenched elites. The radicals passed a constitution with a unicameral legislature, uh, an executive consisting of a plural plural council and a judiciary judiciary with seven year terms. These reforms weakened the oligarchs and made it harder for them to pass special interest legislation. So my question is, um, how did something like this get passed in Pennsylvania? And why was this structure a good one against cronyism? Yeah, so this managed to get passed in Pennsylvania because even though you had Robert Morris and he was had many, uh, and he had a lot of support in Philadelphia with, with other various financial interests, many of whom were connected with the British, and uh, predictably Robert Morris was sort of a holdout against secession um, and, and did not vote for the measure. It was able to get passed in Pennsylvania because there was a good amount of radical support in, in, in the state. And actually, when you look at the politics of the first state government in Pennsylvania in the late 1780s, early, uh, excuse me, in the late 17th, 70s, early 1780s and throughout the throughout the decade, it was kind of a, a, a toss up. They would, one side would gain control and then the other side would gain control and, 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 and so on. And so these types of policies do fight cronyism because uh, having things like term limits or uh, elected officials, um, this does prevent um, having a, like sort of an entrenched um, oligarchy or various elites ruling for a long period of time. One reform that I think actually against cronyism that does have a lot of bipartisan support, except from the except from the elites actually running both parties, is having some form of term limits. Um, regarding our congressmen. We have term limits for the president. We do not have term limits for congressmen. And you can even see this frustration among um, Democrats, who many of whom I would not be allied with or do not think on the same level, uh, but they're upset at someone like Nancy Pelosi, who's continuing to hold on to power as Speaker of the House, et cetera. These types of issues would not be so severe uh, if you did have some sort of rotation preventing people from serving um, for, you know, multiple years consecutively or prevented from serving, um, you know, the, limiting the, the, the number of years they can serve. Absolutely. These types of policies, uh, would make it harder to pass various special interest legislation. Um, having this type of constitution is very important because it set down the precedent that, okay, we're going to at least, uh, describe certain powers the government's, the government will have and certain powers they won't have. So these types of constitutional reforms, many of which continued as late as the 1840s and the 1850s, which I talk about in my book, there were stuff later on, but it's not the subject of my book. Uh, you had new state constitutions that tremendously fought cronyism, uh, particularly general incorporation laws that removed the licensing process for uh, corporations. So trying to get rid of the corporate charter. So it, 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 there's a lot of important stuff that in the Revolutionary War uh, people for people sort of overlook, and I think the process towards state constitutions is very important, and that's why I, I give it space in my own book. Yeah, I, I think that's I think that's an important thing. Oh, and then one other question, just about that structure, because you mentioned it later on when you talk about the Constitution, and and one of the the things that the uh, um, that the elites got. Um, unfortunately, was this bicameral uh, Congress versus a unicameral, and and it, my guess is because that kind of mimics the the um, you know the House of Lords kind of thing in, in England or, or something of that nature. Is 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 that why a bicameral uh, Congress is is kind of helps the elites? Yeah, because at least in the politics of the time, it's important to understand. So the colonial governments were really, you had a royally appointed governor in his council. That was sort of the council was the upper legislature, right? And then you had the democratically appointed assembly. So democracy at this time period, um, although I think democracy has a lot of problems, especially in its modern form, it, democracy in providing more representation, providing more suffrage, making more positions electable, those were tremendous 
um, attacks on cronyism because they at least took power away from the elites and they made the politicians more, um, you know, they had to be responsible and, and serve the wishes of the people. So having uh, frequent uh, elections, um, this was actually a good thing back in the day because it meant that you wouldn't see someone just stay in power for a long period of time and then use this to reward their favorite supporters and, and, and so on. You actually had to uh, make sure you were doing what the people wanted, which in most cases was having a smaller government. So having that upper chamber was sort of an, an additional shield against the people where you have this small group of of congressmen or senators uh, who have an enormous amount of uh, influence over policy that the lower level doesn't have because their terms are longer, um, right. they're, they're, there's higher costs to getting elected and so on. And so one of the big um, uh, features in the, in, the, in the new constitution was having a, a Senate. Instead of having a unicameral legislature as what you had during the in the Articles of Confederation, you, you had not only a House, but you also had a Senate. And remember, if I said one of uh, Pennsylvania's first senators was Robert Morris, <laughs> right? You can kind of see, okay, maybe maybe yeah. this economist he's not so crazy. Like things are making sense because <laughs> the the elites were able to uh, control the Senate much more than they were able to control the House. And there's a lot less senators. We can see this now. Senators have enormous influence. Right, especially now where the, the the Senate is evenly divided, and the Biden administration, the Democrats, they only have fifty senators. A couple senators have an incredible amount of influence over legislation, right. which means uh, they're going to get a, a lot of donations from both sides, and they can play them off each other. And of yeah. course, that means they can use it to benefit themselves and enrich themselves at the public's expense. It, yeah, it, it, it's it's fascinating to see the net worth of these senators just climb on a government salary. It's amazing. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. There is a great a great example is is um, Senator Nelson Aldrich, who's a prominent senator in Rhode Island uh, in the late 19th and early 20th centuries. He started off as a modest grocer, and by the end, uh, when he retired around 1910, he retired a millionaire. And you're like, wow. Uh, wonder, wonder what's going on there. And of course, what you find out is that Senator Nelson Aldrich, um, he had his daughter marry the son of John D. Rockefeller. I'm like, uh -huh. oh, okay. <laughs> you know, that's a pretty good, pretty good marriage. And they sweeten her for the retirement account. Um, and yeah, this stuff happens all of the time. Um, you see it um, even in our own modern political landscape. Uh, uh, senator Mitch McConnell is a big prominent senator in the Republican Party. Uh, he's married to Elena Chow, who is connected huh. with very large Chinese shipping firms. She's she's a uh, in the family of that of a large uh, wealthy family that owns a lot of prominent shipping companies in China. So when you see that, you go like, okay, um, the, the 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 interests become a little clearer. You always have to look at who these people are related to, uh, where these people worked. Uh, and so on. And, and for senators, it's it's no different. Senators, you make a lot of money and you make even more money when you retire because everyone wants to get your opinion. They're going to hire That's you right. on the no-show job. They're going to hire your kids on a no-show job, et cetera. And you can, uh, you can retire um, uh, quite wealthy. Yeah, absolutely. Um, I want to, if you have time, I want to talk about two more characters in your book. And, and we have, and, and folks, we have barely uh, touch the service of this book. Um, again, I'm talking to Dr. Patrick Newman. We're talking about his book, Cronyism, Liberty versus Power in Early America, 1607 to 1849. You can get it at Amazon. Um, but I want to um, I want to talk about two more characters if you've got time. And, and the first one is kind of a, a hero um, in the early part of your book, um, and that's Patrick Henry. And I want to talk to you a little bit about his influence and, and uh, um, you know, uh, as as um, yeah, t talk to me. Talk to me. Talk to us about Patrick Henry and 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 why he's one of the heroes in your book. Sure. So I love Patrick Henry. I swear it has nothing to do with the fact that we share the same first name. <laughs> um, and Patrick Henry, he was he was against cronyism. He was a great uh, proponent of secession. He was a great uh, opponent of the U.S. Constitution. So fighting against the cronyism in the U.S. Constitution, he was someone who had supported states' rights, supported small government. He was suspicious of centralized power. 
And I think he's someone who gets overlooked now, but he's someone who deserves his uh, place in history, especially because in the 1790s, he was uh, really the two most famous Americans. A lot of people don't know this. Everyone would think, yeah, George Washington, he's number one. Patrick Henry was number two. But throughout the Revolutionary War, throughout the 1780s, and even a little bit in the 1790s, Patrick Henry was always fighting against uh, these big um, uh, additions or uh, exacerbations of, of government power. So I, I yeah, he was kind of the he was kind of the Ron Paul of his age, wasn't he? In many ways, yeah, and he did influence um, uh, Jefferson, though Jefferson didn't give him much credit for it. Uh, for him, uh, he did, didn't give much credit to him. Excuse me, uh, but yeah, he was a. Uh, he was kind of a Ron Paul of, of his age. It was the old give me liberty or give me death, um, uh, all, all that good stuff. Um, and yeah, I think he was he was someone who who gets overlooked now, and I think that's very uh, it's, it's very tragic. Yeah. Um, the other character I want to I want to mention is kind of uh, in some ways. Um, oh, I don't know what's the word. Uh, maybe a warning <laughs> and. Uh, um, and that's Thomas Jefferson. Uh, and and, and I, in some ways, I think of Thomas Jefferson, and obviously, you know, he's very, way smarter, um, more principled, more everything good than a Donald Trump. <laughs> but here's the here's the 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 what I want to say about that is he's a guy that had you know amazing expectations. And then I want to talk about what happened and how he fell into cronyism. And I feel the same thing with, with Donald Trump, where he talks a great game and says all kinds of great things. But at the end of the day, you get more of the same. Um, so talk, talk to me about Thomas Jefferson. Yeah, so Thomas Jefferson, a, a great libertarian idealist. He's, he's great with rhetoric. Um, he, he, he genuinely, or not, not rhetoric, he's great with ideology. That'd be more accurate uh, you know, way of describing it. He, he did want to secede from Great Britain. Of course, he writes the Declaration of Independence. He wanted to fight. He did fight Hamilton's cronyism. He had various proposals to downsize the government in the 1790s, weaken the Bank of the United States, our first central bank, get rid of various taxes, weaken the treasury, even push for an amendment that would weaken the government's ability to borrow. Right, which would, in Thomas Jefferson's mind, um, prevent it from engaging in various destructive foreign wars, many of which benefited various commercial interests and so on. And he's got all this great rhetoric, uh, but when he becomes president, he really kind of drops the ball. And this is he just wasn't that good of a leader. He does moderate. Power does corrupt him. He uh, passes some good reforms at the beginning of his administration in his first term, but his second term, especially with the Louisiana Purchase, it really just goes downhill. And uh, yeah, you know, some people could say there there are parallels between him and Donald Trump. I think there are more parallels between Andrew Jackson and Donald Trump. But mm. it, it's 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 a great illustration of Thomas Jefferson's career is a great illustration of how power corrupts even the best uh, and, and most well-intentioned reformers into moderation and outright cronyism. Right. That's a, um, yeah, that's, that's what I'm, in fact, in fact, and, and, and I've <laughs> we're running out of time, but I do want to touch on Andrew Jackson because he, he is a great part of this book. So, so quickly, maybe, maybe make that comparison to Trump and Andrew Jackson and, uh, um, and talk to me about, you know, uh, yeah, let's go there. Yeah, so Andrew Jackson, um, I, I would say there are similarities between him and Trump. They both were sort of populist. They were fighting against uh, corruption and cronyism. You know, and, uh, Donald Donald Trump's um, his, his campaign slogan "Drain the Swamp." Uh, was in many ways similar to what Andrew Jackson was trying to do: fight DC cronyism. Uh, Andrew Jackson. Um, had supported a vigorous sort of executive to get stuff done. That was kind of what Donald Trump was trying to do. Andrew Jackson was in favor of rotating out federal officials, so trying to get rid of this entrenched um, uh, bureaucracy known uh, by its proponents as the uh, civil service um, in favor of rotation in office, trying to practice the old uh, anti-federalist principle of rotation in office and term limits. Uh, Donald Trump, in many ways, is similar. He was constantly rotating out uh, officials. He also had his own separate cabinet. It wasn't his actual cabinet. It was kind of like a kitchen cabinet um, of informal advisors. Trump had this 
uh, Andrew Jackson had this. I think there's a lot of similarities. Um, uh, Andrew Jackson did go on to win an election. Um, uh, you know, his, his reelection, Donald Trump, unfortunately, I guess his, his reelection turned out to be more like Martin Van Buren's. Uh, but there are a <laughs> lot of similarities between Trump and Jackson. Um, you know, their policies might have been different, but they both were responding to sort of popular outrage against how the current system worked. Right. They were definitely men of the people. They're men that are speaking to the unheard, as as we might say today. Mm -hmm. So that's and and I so uh, one last question for you, Patrick. And again, I really appreciate you, you taking the time to be on. What um, as you were researching this book, what was maybe the biggest surprise or, or something that that you um, that you found interesting that you didn't know before that that you thought, wow, th this is <laughs> this is wild. Um, what, what was maybe one thing that, as you were researching this book for you? Yeah, so I would say the one uh, surprising thing that I found wild was just, again, when you look at actually the, the, the relevant financial interests of various politicians or judges, just how – um, how how crony they were. And a lot of stuff you don't hear about at all in your traditional American history class, it's it's actually quite important. So a lot of people know about the great Chief Justice of the Supreme Court, you know, John Marshall and all of the, you know, big government decisions he did, you know, Marbury versus Madison, McCulloch versus Maryland, and so on. What you don't learn about is that John Marshall was a very prominent land, land speculator um, whose brother... J, you know, James Marshall married the daughter of Robert Morris, and both Marshalls <laughs> worked together with Robert Morris on a lot of land ventures. Some of the Supreme Court's rulings uh, during this time period were related to land speculation that directly or indirectly um, affected Robert Moore, uh, excuse me, not Robert Morris, um, John Marshall's own business dealings. And so when I read this, I was I was immediately shocked. And, and this is something, it was all buried in the various obscure books or in obscure passages that you're like, why don't you talk more about this and less about the other stuff, but it's just it's it's ex illustrations of that, or examples of cronyism that elites have done so good at hiding, but they're they're so uh, prominent in American history that I just found that the most fascinating. Yeah, no, that's that is interesting. It, it is. It's like, and it's the same today. It's like they're hiding in plain sight, and and, and you, you could say the same thing about you know the the vaccines today, like. All of this government money going to all of these programs—it's—it's it's hiding in plain sight. It's all there for us to to find, and we can and we see it. But it's like we don't want to acknowledge that that our leaders are leading us astray or something. I don't know. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Yeah. Well, I I want to thank you again, Doctor Patrick Newman, for for being on the show. Um, his book is Cronyism: Liberty versus Power in Early America. 1607 to 1849. Um, you can pick it up on Amazon. Is there other places you, you, that people can find the book? Where, what, how can people find out about you and your doings? Um, so you can find, you can pick up the book at Mises.org or on Amazon. You can get it in hardcover, paperback, or Kindle. An audio book will be coming out this year uh, of the book. You can find uh, more about me. I'm on social media at Dr. Patrick Newman. I'm on Twitter. I'm also a part of a podcast with Phil Bishop, Liberty versus Power, where I talk about the book Cronyism as well as other events in American history. You can find that on YouTube. So uh, yeah, that's basically, uh, you, I'm, I'm, I'm all around uh, and I appreciate your time listening to this podcast and I hope you, you, you buy the book. Right on. I hope so too. I think it's well worth the read. Um, and uh, uh, and let me also mention the, that yeah that we've just touched the service on this book. Um, you want a little bit more in depth the podcast and of course go buy the book because because the there's a he Patrick is a really great writer. Um, again, I'm a I'm a crazy musician, so uh, you know I I followed it and I it it, it, it kept me reading. So I'm <laughs> that's a good sign. Um, so thank you, Patrick, for being on. And if love remains. Oh, thank you so much for having me on. All right, this is Mike Levitt, and you've been listening to... And the Flavor Man.